elements to be here today. Good job. Good job. First thing I'd like to say is Pastor Tim's not here today. Uh, he's taking a day off. Uh, we're blessed to have Pastor Greg Carlson here with us this morning. He's from Wings of Hope. You're welcome. Him. And as a special treat, he's not only going to preach for us, he's going to provide our music today, too. Okay. We've got, of course, the adult Sunday school downstairs, 9 a.m. Ladies' Bible studies, Tuesdays, 2 to 3.30. Evening prayer, Wednesdays, 6.30 to 7.30. We got the prayer warriors. What a good job they do. We're very thankful for our prayer warriors. Wednesdays, 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. in the sanctuary. I don't know if that's on right now with Sue. I think they're down in Florida, aren't they? Oh, you're still meeting? Okay, great. Okay. And Thursday night, adult Bible school, school 6.30 to 7.30. Are there any other announcements anybody knows we need? Okay, that's a whole page full of that. Yep, we have uh, the calendar came in your bulletins this morning. That's helpful. Take that home with you. Put it on the fridge. Okay, let's all pray together. Well, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you in your house this morning. We ask that you would bless our efforts this day and every day, Lord. And we would grow in our knowledge and love of you and that you would help us to walk that path. You would have us walk. This day and every day. Amen. It's a pleasure to meet some new Christian friends today and to be with you in this moment to be able to lift up our praise to God. I was uh, asked if we could do some of the traditional hymns, and so I've picked out some of those today. And I'm going to ask you to join in at times to sing along with me. I, I love the new songs and I love the old songs. But I had to wonder now, uh, I'm not sure at my age whether I should be singing in public or not anymore. <laughs> but then I remembered that Willie Nelson and Bob Dylan are still singing well into their 80s. So I decided to go for it. So... We're going to start out with a song. I'm going to sing a little bit for you on uh, How Great Thou Art, and then I'll ask you to join me on a chorus. You might want to stand when we get to that. I'll, I'll cue you in, and then we'll sing the chorus together, all right? <clears throat> O oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. And when I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can When on the cross My burden gladly bearing He bled and died To take away my sin
shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart and I shall In humble adoration And there proclaim My God, how great Thou art Now would you stand and join me? We'll sing that chorus. Then sings my soul God, there's no one like him. What a great God. I love to hear you sing, too. You love to sing here, don't you? All right. Well, you can be seated. And I think, our Dean, I've forgotten now. Are we going to have the prayer next, or are we going to do the song next? All right. There's a great theme in the scripture of the grace of God. And... It's reflected in the words that we just sang about God sending his son. And we know that when he came, he came to voluntarily give himself up at the cross. And one of the old favorite songs is, On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. We sing together. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. by the world has a wondrous attraction for me for the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to it to dark Calvary so I'll I will. 
to have a, a time of prayer. Good morning. It's great, great to see you all here this morning. And thank you very much, Greg. Just um, glad to have you here. Um, before we go to prayer this morning, <clears throat> I would like to read through a couple chapters of scripture, both Psalm 46 and Psalm 91. I think they're very appropriate and needful considering the disconcerting times that uh, we're living in right now. And they both have to do with God being our security and our refuge. So Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength a very ready help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth shakes and the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. There is a river whose streams make the city of God happy, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice and the earth quaked. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has inflicted horrific events on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the, the bow and cuts a spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Stop striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. The God of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. And then Psalm 91. The one who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will lodge in the shadow of the Almighty. 
I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who rescues you from the net of the trapper and from the deadly plague. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you may take refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a wall. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, of the plague that stalks in darkness or of the destruction that devastates at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the retaliation against the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, the Most High your dwelling place. No evil will happen to you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. On their hands they will lift you up so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will walk upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the young lion and the serpent. Because he has loved me, I will save him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. I will satisfy him with a long life and show him my salvation. Let's look to the Lord now in prayer. Father, we are very grateful that you hold us in the hollow of your hand for your care and your covering over us and your timely provisions for us. You are our refuge and our strength and a ready help in trouble. We thank you for this day for our very lives and the Holy Spirit's presence with us who have claimed your Son as Savior and Lord and personally acknowledged his atoning sacrifice on our behalf. We have thus become new creatures in Christ through the gift of faith. Please let us not take you or our neighbor for granted, but rather live out our faith thoughtfully and sincerely being diligent as we see the day approaching. We trust you to establish the work of our hands, helping us to make the most of our time as the days are evil. Lord, we pray for comfort and strength for Robin Watt in the wake of the recent passing of her mother and also Judith and her family with the loss of her dad three weeks ago, four months after the passing of her mother. Thank you then in Christ, we do have hope and assurance that our loved ones of faith are with you in heaven. We lift up Mark Schuster and Paulette Green, both dealing with heart issues. And we also pray for Jim Durham for a full healing of his heart and lungs. We thank you so much that Julie Chukta is back amongst us once again. We're so grateful for her life and her service and witness. Pray that you would bless Mark Rutherford's mother recuperating from a broken hip. And we continue to lift up Rachel Raymond, Cindy Beerman, Marilee Corwin, and Chuck and the various needs and challenges that they have. We especially think of and pray for Bill Burt, Jeff's stepson in stage four liver failure Help him to come to know you as Savior and Lord in these crucial hours. Our hearts and prayers go out to Bob and Mary Ann as they navigate exceptionally trying times within their family. Father, we pray your great blessing on Pastor Tim and Lynn, um, or Pastor Tim, I should say, spending a week up north in the UP, resting but also being available to Rachel and the grandkids. May their time be restorative and productive. We who are here today remember and intercede on behalf of those contending with illness, including my dear wife, Judith, dealing with the challenging flu virus. Please bring her and any others who are out sick back to full health and vitality soon. We lift up the local ministries we support, including Wings of Hope, 
Kalamazoo Gospel Mission, Gene Watson Ministry, True Vine Equestrian Center, Miracle Camp, and the South Bend Jail Ministry. May their works bring hope, healing, and inspiration to many souls. And we thank you, Lord, for our fellow Americans who strongly embrace our Founders' ideals, be they congressmen, senators, governors, true health professionals, real journalists, and simply fellow ordinary citizens working at getting the truth out in spite of the censorship and canceling. Dear Lord, in closing, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill and direct the remainder of our service. May we each consider how we may support and build one another up this day and this week within our families, neighborhoods, and communities in accordance with your will. And now be with Greg Carlson as he brings your word and the message that you've laid on his heart. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. I am thankful for the privilege to be with you this morning, and I've been looking forward to looking into God's Word with you. And I'd like to invite you back in the Old Testament to 1 Chronicles chapter 17. And this is a reflection of David's heart a little bit later on in his life. And uh, it certainly corresponds with the Psalms that were read for us just a little bit earlier as David recognized God as his Savior. And that's the great amazement in his life when he sits down and takes up his pen and reflecting on the goodness and the grace of God at this stage. In chapter 17, in verse 1, we see that David was settled into his palace at this point. He was no longer on the run, and he was enjoying the fact that his dynasty had been established. And then we come in chapter 1 to verse 10 to 12, and there he is aware that his throne will be forever. Not because he would live on the throne forever, but because of his greater son, the Lord Jesus, who would set up his rule and reign forever on the throne of David as it is described in, in the scripture. So it was with this realization that David, with characteristic humility, went before the Lord and just poured out the amazement of his heart in how God had blessed him with his grace. And so we read in, in chapter 17 and beginning in verse 16, when David went in and he sat before the Lord, he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my family that you have brought me thus far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, O God, you have spoken about the future of the house of your servant and have looked on me as though I were the most exalted of men, O God. What more can David say to you for honoring your servant? For you know your servant, O Lord, for the sake of your servant and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made known all these great promises. He's just wrapped up in how God has blessed him and in the grace of God in his life. And that phrase there just stands out in verse 18 where he says, you know your servant. God knew that he was human. And when we think of David writing in another place in Psalm 103, he says, you know my frame, you remember that I am dust. God knew that David is human. And so he says in this passage, and you knew me. And David had some things in his life that he rather had not been. 
And as he, as he came before the Lord, in this, even in this setting, he had the understanding that this God knew about those things. And yet, even in knowing what David had done in the past, God forgave him. David was amazed at how God had blessed him and put him in the palace and established his throne forever, but he, at the same time, kept these thoughts in mind of his failures. And it made the blessing of God seem much sweeter to him to know that God had forgiven him and God would still use him. It wasn't something that David earned. It was by the grace of God. It wasn't something that David paid for, even though by that point he was a wealthy man. It wasn't anything that he could earn or anything that he could pay for, but God just did it for him. It reminds me of two pastors that were going to a conference down in Georgia, and they were coming from up north, and one of those pastors had never been in the south before. And so they stopped at a restaurant one morning, and their meal was delivered, and the pastor who had never been in the south before saw this pile of white mush on his plate. And so when the, the server came back around, he said to her, um, what is this? And she said, why, sir, that is grits. And he said, grits? I didn't order grits, and I'm not going to pay for grits. And she said, well, down here, you don't have to order them. You don't have to pay for them. They're just yours. So he learned a, a lesson about Southern culture in a big hurry there. And some of you may have an appreciation for grits as well. Like David, I am so thankful for the unmerited favor in my life. I didn't order it. I couldn't pay for it. He just gave it. There's nothing that we can do that would merit the grace of God in our life. And yet, that's who he is. He is a gracious God, and he gives us, which he gives us even while we are yet sinners. And it's a lavish grace that he gives to us. And as I look back on my own story, I remember the time in my life when I was not yet a friend of God. I was his enemy. I didn't realize it at the time. I probably thought of myself as a friend of God. But in looking back at that time in my life, I'm so glad that God did not open the back door and throw me out on the trash heap, but he gave his grace to me. And like David experienced, God used him in his unfolding plan of redemption. And it means so much to me to know that God would use me even though I have had such a sorry past. I'd made a profession of faith when I was about five years old. And my mother tells me about how she and dad explained the cross to me and how I needed to, to accept Jesus as my Savior. And I may, I may even have well said a prayer to God. And, and I understood at the time that Christ had had victory over the grave and victory over Satan and victory over death and entrusting him as my Savior, I knew that I could have that same victory for myself. And uh, my mother tells me how back then we just memorized hundreds of verses. One year we memorized the whole book of James because that was the way to get a discount at camp at church summer camp and so we memorized and mom kept us after it and we did year after year in my growing up years in my family of origin we we memorized a lot of scripture and we went to church three times a week at least we'd be there on sunday morning and, and sunday night and then on wednesday night and my father was a pastor 
And I not only heard him teach the Word of God for years after years, but he faithfully, as the Christian father, had family devotions in which he taught us the Word of God at home. And so I had all kinds of influence in understanding the Gospel, and it had been presented to me clearly, but my heart was far from God. I was rebellious as could be. I was arrogant. I was just a cocky little preacher's kid. I thought that I knew everything. I thought that I was entitled to everything. And it was, as I look back at that narcissistic little brat, I think, what in the world was wrong with him? And I cursed. And I actually many times was not in my right mind as I grew through my teenage years. I got involved with uh, illegal drugs and I was not in a relationship with God. I wasn't in a relationship with His people even though I showed up where the people of God gathered. And I lied at the drop of a hat and I was stuck in my condition. It wasn't a pretty sight. And I've gone back now and I've apologized to my parents so many times that they, now they just say, oh, we don't remember that anymore. Don't you worry about it. And they pat me on the head and it's experience of their grace. But there I was. And even though I had all of these great influences, I was stuck. My heart was not open to the Lord. My mind wasn't open to the Lord. I, my eyes couldn't see Him for who He really was. There I was in my teenage years and being stuck in my sin. Wilburn Elias Best expresses my sorry state when he said, The sinner, apart from grace, is unable to be willing and unwilling to be able. Grace represents the unlimited kindness of God to people who are unable to save ourselves. There's nothing that we can do to purchase our salvation. We can't earn our salvation. We're stuck in a place of blindness and hardness of heart until the grace of God works within us and brings us to a time of salvation. Someone once said the grace of salvation is a gift and you can't boast about a gift. You can only be thankful. I'm so thankful for the grace of God in the spirit that he sent to my cold, arrogant heart. I'm so glad for his gracious spirit that came to me and brought life to me. Paul says in Ephesians that I was dead in my trespasses and my sin. And if you were to look over in Ephesians with me in chapter 2 in verses 1 to 9, you see this wonderful gift that God has given to us even when we were walking away from him. Paul is speaking in the past tense to the Ephesian Christians here and reminding them, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness 
to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Can you turn those wonderful words over in your mind and just recognizing if you're a believer in Christ today, what your life was like before coming to Christ. And for the wonderful work that he did through his spirit in taking someone that was dead to him and making them alive. The spirit of God can take a heart like that and make it alive with appreciation and thanksgiving to the Savior for who he is and what he has done. That passage in the New Testament, that very work of God's grace in a person's life is foretold back in the Old Testament times in Ezekiel in chapter 36. And I want to read a couple of verses there to show that the grace of God is an answer to a prophecy that was made way back centuries before the time of Christ. In Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26, the prophet says, in, in representing the very heart of God, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Here's the promise and looking forward to the day when God in his mercy would place his spirit within the hearts of his people to empower them to be able to trust in God, to be able to see who God is and to follow him in obedience in their lives. In the context of that Old Testament passage, the Lord is talking about his provision and the land that he would give to his people. And there was a, a sense of his covenant promises were there. But this would be during the time of the Old Testament people, as well as the time of the New Testament people, contingent on the gift of the Spirit of God. In the Old Testament time, the Spirit came and went more, where in the New Testament time, the Spirit of God takes up permanent residence in the life of every believer. And it is through the residence of the Spirit of God in our hearts that we can see God for who He is, that we can appreciate Him, that we can love Him, and that we can follow Him. There's a book that I highly recommend wherever I go that is written by John Eldridge, and the title is Waking the Dead. And it speaks about the new, some of you have read it, and it speaks about the new heart that God gives to his people. It's not the same wicked old heart. It's not the arrogant, self-centered heart that we had before. He gives us a new heart by the work of the Spirit in our life. And so instead of having a heart that is unable to respond in love, in obedience to God, God would give a new heart. And the Spirit that lives within us was a part of His own initiative. Nothing that we earned, nothing that we paid for, he just gave it to us as a gift of his grace. So when we come back to the New Testament in Titus in chapter 3 and verses 5 to 6, we read actually in verse 4, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, 
by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. <coughs> Excuse me. What a gift to be thankful for. Can, you just, can we just stop in this moment and recognize the wonderful gift that God has given us in His gracious Spirit who comes into our life and he makes the things of Christ real. He gives us a love for Christ, a desire to follow Christ. Without the Spirit, we have nothing. Without the Son, we have nothing. Without the Father, we have nothing. But today, just to be thankful for the wonderful gift that the Spirit of God has done in our hearts by the grace of God. To take that a step further now, it was the word of grace that brought salvation to me. Paul was talking about that in Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. And in that passage, Paul was leaving the Ephesian Christians with the word of grace which means the communication of God's grace that the Holy Spirit inspired and the Holy Spirit illumines the very Word of God, the Word of grace, the grace that God has given to us is captured in the Word of God. I was raised in a, a really legalistic home. And I've talked about that with my parents, and we processed that, and Laura Lee and I wanted to raise our five children in a way that, and I, I tell you, it, it wasn't easy to break loose from that mindset of legalism. That was the church that we were a part of was quite legalistic. The denomination that the church was in was quite legalistic and in a way that's all we knew and my dad grew up in that and my mom grew up in that kind of a culture and in their churches and they raised their family that way and the 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 rules of scripture and then add on quite a few after that those those were important things in the culture of the, the church that we were a part of. And there were all kinds of things. And back in the, the 60s and the 70s, there were things that we weren't supposed to do. And, and it was of a, a Baptist heritage, so you, you can fill in there pretty well. The, the kind of culture that, that I was raised up in. And, Somewhere along the line, in, in my late teens, I, I started to understand the grace of God, the measure of His grace. And I, honestly, and looking back, I don't, I don't think I understood that earlier on. I didn't understand how much God loved me. I didn't see the abundance of His grace in the way He looked at me. I think... Back then, I kind of saw God looking at me with angry eyes. And then as time went along, I started to see him looking at me with love in his eyes. And so, it is the abundance of God's grace that gives us the gift of righteousness in Romans chapter 5. And, and in different influences that he was building into my life, with different people that I knew, different teaching that I was hearing, I was starting to understand the grace of God and being a child of his favor and his blessing being poured out on me. And I struggled with it then. And I, to be honest with you, I still struggle with it at times now in reverting to my default position of legalism I, I sometimes struggle with the fact that God is so gracious toward me. 
And sometimes I, I look at myself and I think I don't have a lot of motivation at times. I'm, I'm not given to actually obeying the Lord. And there are times still when I will question my salvation just back th as it was back then when I would question how could God be gracious to someone like me? And as I've gone along, I have learned that he understands that I am human. That's real clear. I think one of the, the most reassuring passages in the scripture to the New Testament believer is in the Old Testament in Psalm 103, where David says, he knows my frame. He remembers that I am but dust. He was personalizing that thought, and yet he has compassion upon me, as a father has compassion on his children. It's one thing to see the grace of God in relation to my sin and the forgiveness that I have. It was another thing for me to see the grace of God in my apparent lack of resolve to follow him. God understands even that about us. And there's, there's never an excuse for sin, and Paul talks about that in, in Romans. But there, there is still a very liberating thought of the grace of God reaching into my motivations in understanding the struggles that I have at times in following him. He is, he is a gracious God, and he knows me like he knew David full well, and yet he loves me still. So the grace of God brought life to me through his spirit, through the word of grace and finally it was grace that justified me and in looking in Romans chapter 3 in verse 24 I want to just get a taste of the the justifying grace of God today and I think you'll enjoy this too, this, this work that God has, has done. And so in chapter 3 of Romans, in verse 24, well, in verse 23, well, no, let's start in verse 21, as long as we're at it. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. He's been talking about Jew and Gentile and the different, uh, different kinds of people. And then he recognizes in verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, now watch this. And we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. There's the, the justifying grace of God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like David, I had broken God's law. I probably had broken every one of God's laws by the time I was, by, I was done with it. And friends, we all stand guilty under the condemnation of the law. We all have to do with an angry God without his grace. We all stand before him as condemned to die. But in God's courtroom, God's grace forgives everyone who believes 
in the name of the Son of God. There's God's grace that just stands so brilliant on the black background of sin. It is justification by grace through faith that is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. This is what God has blessed us with as his family members. And so at age 19, I repented of my sin. I had at least the beginning of an understanding of the grace of God in my life. And it was so attractive to me and so winsome. And I appreciated Christ so much for paying the price for the grace. And I came to him in submission to him. And my, I believe my life of faith really began at that point. I think that's where the Holy Spirit came in. My, if my mom was here, she'd say, oh no, I think you were saved when you were five. Well, <clears throat> with all due respect, I, I saw a change that took place in my hardened heart to be, at least start the path of humility before him. I still struggle with that too. But this, the path of humility before the Lord for what he had done for me it is just so overwhelming to stop and think of his forgiveness for us. I'm the spiritual caregiver at Wings of Hope Hospice. You've, you know about that here, I'm sure, because Diane is a board member and, and has had such a part in the development of Wings of Hope over the years. And, I find it a great privilege to be a part of that organization as well as a chaplain or a spiritual care coordinator and to be able to address the spiritual needs not only of our patients and their families but of our staff as well. I just, I'm so thankful that God has given me that ministry to be able to um, have that care for his, the people that are, are part of Wings. But about six years ago, I was asked by our director, uh, Dr. Teresa Lynn, I was asked if I would do a little uh, presentation at our annual auction. That's a fundraiser that we have. We have several fundraisers each year and for the Wings Home and for Wings of Hope. And, and uh, she asked if I would tell a story, a patient story at the auction. And I felt like she was asking me to stand up in front of the group and to tell a story. And I was comfortable for that. But then in her wisdom, Teresa said, no, I want you to do this on a video. Well, I don't know where it came from, but I don't do well with cameras and I just I never have felt comfortable in front of a camera but she insisted and she was right in the end I, I have to give her that she insisted that I tell my story on a video that would be played for the people at the auction at a, at a key time in, in the fundraising effort that was going on there that night and so Sure enough, here came a couple of students over from Allegan High School that were in the video class, and they sat me down in a chair, and they had a camera up there. One was focused on my face, and one was focused on my hands. Diane's done videos for us, too, and knows how this works. And they had a, a whole uh, camera that was panned back a little bit, and it was um, kind of unnerving for me in trying to keep my train of thought and to say the words that were in order at that time. And I stammered quite a bit, and then I would say, ah, uh, and I would lose my train of thought, and, and the girls, I'd say, let's just start over. And so they'd, they'd start their little cameras all over again, and we worked through it, and it was awkward, and it was awful, and I started to sweat, and I thought, oh, Lord, I... This is just not me. And those, those little high school girls, they said, now, Mr. Carlson, don't you worry about a thing. We're going to take all of this footage back, and we're going to edit it. They do digital editing now. That's a lot easier than cutting tape. But we're gonna, we'll take out all of the bad parts, and we're going to keep the good parts. 
Don't you worry about a thing. So as it was, our family went on vacation for a couple of weeks. After, when we got back, the auction would take place in May, what is it, the third week of May? And I just, I was, I was nervous the whole time on that. I was uptight. I thought, I mean, there's a lot of people that come to the auction. There may be about 300 people, something like that, or 600. And so, I mean, this is like the community uh, in Allegan and I, in surrounding areas. And I, and I thought, oh, goodness, I don't even want to go. But I went, and I sat back in the back row that night, and the time came for the video, and the lights went down, and there was the video. And I watched, kind of like, like that, and I watched, and I thought, hmm, I think this might be all right. And sure enough, what they had done was to take out all of the awes and all of those awkward pauses when I lost my train of thought. And somehow, they got the message put down in something that looked pretty decent. And the people seemed to, to like it. I mean, they, they talked about it afterwards, it being very moving. And we raised a lot of money that night for Wings of Hope. And, and I thought, isn't that like the grace of God? You and I have videos of our life. Um, each of us have things in our lives that we rather would not have been. And you say, well, there's, there's a lot of things that nobody knows about in my life. And I would say to you from Hebrews 4 and verse 13, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. What would happen if the video of your life I mean, the unedited version of your life was put up on the screens here this morning. And all of those things that you muttered under your breath and all of those, those things that you were involved with at, at weaker times of your life, maybe if you go back to your youth, if you go back in your life, well... If, that, if all of that was put up on the screens this morning, when it got done, would you come up to the front and take a bow and thank, thank the people for applauding? I can tell you I wouldn't. I wouldn't be in the back row. I'd be out the door. And yet God in his mercy in justifying us as if we'd never sinned has chosen not to remember. He has edited out every bad thing in our life. Everything that is contrary to his spirit and to his word. All of that is taken out of our lives. He, doesn't, he chooses not to remember that against us because he is a gracious God. I wouldn't be surprised that those girls could have pasted back in some of the awkward bad parts in my video, and it may still be on their memory and their, their cameras somewhere, <clears throat> but when God takes something out of our life and forgives us by his grace, it's gone. It's gone. He uses the term, the depths of the sea. <clears throat> if you were to think now at the Mackinac Bridge, say on the Labor Day walk, have some of you been across the bridge on the Labor Day walk? Some of you have. So let's say there's this young guy and he wants to propose to his, his girlfriend for marriage on Labor Day at the Mackinac Bridge. And so they are walking along and they get up to the highest part of the bridge in between the mid-span, they call it, between the two towers. 
and he kind of pulls her aside out of the flow of tra foot traffic over to the railing of the, the side of the bridge, and he, he says to her some sweet things that he's been rehearsing in his mind all morning, and then he goes down on one knee, and he asks her if she will marry him, and the people that are going now realize what's going on, and some of them are stopping to watch and enjoy the moment of this young couple. And she says, yes. And he stands up with a ring in his hands, and it is uh, the sparkle of the sunlight and all of those colors of that beautiful diamond are just dazzling in front of her. And as he stands up, his hand brushes against that railing and that ring just slips out of his finger and it's gone. Standing there, they're 200 feet above the water and then under the surface of the water at mid-span is 300 feet. So that ring falls 500 feet and it is gone. He can't dive in and get it. It's, it's gone. God's grace is such in our lives that the part that he edits out for forgiveness is gone. It's not coming back. We can just be thankful to him for what he's done. All right, shall we stop there? All right. I want to uh, sing as a prayer. We'll, we'll end with prayer this morning, but I want to sing a little uh, part that leads into Amazing Grace, and then if you would join me on the song Amazing Grace, that's how we'll finish this morning. All right. sing with the morning sun and bless his name when the day is done for he has redeemed me and called me his own and made of my Savior knows no boundaries. The precious unmerited favor of God has been debts have been canceled and nailed to the tree. The precious unmerited favor of God has been The 
precious unmerited favor of God has been extended to me mercy and pardon still reaches out to all who believe would you stand please amazing for last Pastor Carlson for his message and his music. I thought both were excellent. <laughs> I got to tell you, the part that really touched me was the part about the ring because I just had a, about a week ago, what happens sometimes my hands swell. I eat salt and stuff, hands swell. And my ring becomes uncomfortable, so I take it off my ring finger and I put it on my pinky. Well, that happened to be about a week ago, and then later on in the day, all of a sudden I look down and my ring's gone. I have no idea where my wedding ring is. <laughs> I'm hoping it'll show up soon, but... Gone. Gone, yep. <laughs> and the other thing I wanted to say, too, I was remiss in the beginning. I wanted to say how great it is to see Alan Nell here this morning and, and Dar Darren and Kathy here this morning. Both of them have been a while. Really glad to have you here. I hope everybody takes a little chance before they leave to tell them how glad we are they're back. With that being said, let us go and love and serve the Lord this day and forever. Alleluia, alleluia. Amen. <laughs> You're dismissed. Perfect. Thank you. mm.